Today I want to talk to you about a passage um, that is seldom preached today. I'm going to move this closer to my mouth, so I'm going to go take preacher voice. You ready? Here it comes. <laughs> and, and from this um, teaching today, um, one that we seldom talk about because of, nobody likes to talk about the judgment of God, but how many know that we're a church that preaches Genesis through Revelation? Um, we believe all the gospel, that it's God-breathed, it's, it's able to help us and to transform us. And so I want to bring to you a word today of hope. How many know that good things can come from judgment? Uh, judgment can go in your favor. Um, but I want, to, I want to talk about uh, different judgments. But let's start with our passage uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 through 27. But as it is, he has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We're talking about Jesus here. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Wow. It's appointed unto man once to die. Um, for many, uh, we have lost loved ones. We have lost friends. Um, we have lost those who have been our role models, who have taught us how to live godly lives. And, and we know that that statement is true. It's appointed unto man once to die. Um, it is said that, um, and, and many have, have proclaimed this truth, that uh, nothing is sure in life but death and taxes. Uh, I want to add one more thing to your list from this verse. Uh, yes, you will die, and yes, you must pay taxes, but you will stand before the Lord one day and give an account for what you have done. And depending on how you're living, that's either a joyful statement or that is a scary statement. Let's take a look at some of the major judgments in Scripture. I don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, I may not have time to go through the ones I have yet before you today, but we're going um, to put on our thinking caps and we're going to go quickly through the first couple. The first is the judgment of Christ on the cross. I mean, we just celebrated uh, our our life of freedom because of his death. Um, Christ was judged on our behalf. All of our sin, past, present, and future, was placed upon him. And he was punished for our sin. He gave his life so that we could live and live free from the consequences of our sins. Can I get an amen? amen. But there is a judgment um, that is to bring correction for believers. We know that for the sinner, the wrath of God is already being poured out. We know that from Romans chapter 1 um, because uh, they have separated themselves from God and are choosing to live according to their own ways. Wrath of God, the wrath of God is already being poured out on those that are not believers. But there are some judgments. There's some evaluation that God does for believers. And even in communion, we learned that uh, Paul says that we're to take communion in a worthy fashion meaning that we're to examine ourselves, we're to judge ourselves, and see if there's anything in there that we need to confess or make right before the Lord. Uh, we want to come before him uh, repentant and humble when we partake of communion. And when we fail to do that, um, Paul says that some sicknesses come upon us and that some of us are even die prematurely when we don't live and honor the things that God has given us for our benefit. In other words, if God has given us good things and we mock the good things that he gives us, then not only do they not produce what we hope they would produce, but rather God brings temporary judgment uh, on us. Um, and uh, that is one of, the, one of the contemporary judgments. Another, how many know that the way you live your life can impact how God hears your prayers. 
Um, the Bible says that when we are in a disagreement with our wife, our spouse, um, that God doesn't listen to our prayers. Wow. I want to be in good relationship with Brenda because I want God to hear me and answer my prayers. Amen? And one of my prayers is God help her to live with me so we can live in agreement. Um, but there are, some, there are other things, right? How many know that there are consequences of sin? And while we're not condemned as far as separated from God because of sin, there are still consequences. When we sin, when we put sin into action, it produces a negative consequence. It harms us and it harms other people. And, and God knows we're going to sin. He knows we're going to make mistakes. He knows we're going to at times live separate from his desire and plan for our life. And he has made a way for forgiveness. But while we're living in that sin, there are consequences. Now, how many of you have experienced a consequence of sin in your life? Yes, we all have. And so there is a contemporary judgment. And then uh, where I want to spend more time, because it pertains to most of us here today, and most of us that are, are, are watching online, is called the judgment seat of Christ. And this is a judgment where those of us uh, who are serving the Lord, who have not only confessed our sins before him, but actually following him, and he's the Lord of our life, uh, the Bible promises uh, that we will be caught up together with God and that we will face judgment not... Uh, for all the bad things we have done, although that judgment is for good and evil, which we'll see, the evil, the payment for that, Christ is going to take upon himself, and the good things are going to be evaluated by God to see if they were done um, to honor and glorify God. Let's take a look at a, a couple scriptures first in um, Thess First Thessalonians 4.13. Then we'll look at 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10. I'm going to just read them consecutively. It says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep and those who have died, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. I'm so grateful that, that uh, the grief that I have is not without hope. I know that for my father who loved the Lord, uh, who has passed on to his reward, uh, I know that I will see him again, and though I grieve the loss, I have, uh, I have this joy to know that we'll be together with the Lord forever. Amen. And so we believe that Jesus died and rose again so that we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have died or fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have passed before us. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. In 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 6 through 10, we find out that after this rapture, uh, we will uh, stand before God and face judgment. And it says, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Now, why do we want to please him? Verse 10, for we must all, say that word all, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one, say that each one, point to your neighbor and say that means you too, may receive what is due for what he or she has done in this body, whether good or evil. How many know that Christians sometimes can do evil things? Uh, how many are one of them? I got my hand up. There are times I, I've done things that aren't, aren't what God wants, and God is going to pass judgment on that. I, the, the evil I do doesn't go without judgment. It's just placed upon Christ. 
And that's why I don't want to keep placing upon him more and more and more grief for my sin. Are you with me? Say amen. So let's take a look. What is the judgment seat of Christ? First of all, it is for those believers, both dead and alive, caught up together in the rapture. Uh, The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is not determined whether one gets into heaven or not. That's already been settled. Um, The purpose is to determine the value of how we've lived our life after our salvation. After we've come to Christ, how have we lived our life? What is the quality? What is the, the, the way that we've lived? Is it honoring unto the Lord? Does it bring glory uh, to God through Christ Jesus? Have we taken the grace that's been given to us, and have we extended grace to others in the mercy that he gave us as well? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, again, the apostle Paul is speaking, and he gives us uh, kind of the context of what this judgment looks like. And he says, uh, basically, I've laid a foundation, and the, the generations that follow are going to be judged by the quality of the work in building upon this foundation of Jesus Christ. He says, now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose disclose it. So when you're before him in the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to show uh, uh, clearly whether it was done for the Lord or it was done for self. Because it will be revealed by fire. Fire represents judgment. It's going to be inspected. How many of you guys uh, or ladies were in the military? Anybody? Yeah, I see a few. How many of you loved it when it was time for inspection? Oh, you like that? <laughs> yeah, glutton for punishment. <laughs> but inspection means they're coming to make sure that everything you're doing is in alignment with what you've been commanded to do. The way your shoes are, the way your bed's made, uh, every aspect of of your life is under scrutiny, and any time that you step outside and do things your own way, you're brought back into alignment. You're corrected. And so here, though, there is not going to be correction. There's just going to be reward or no reward. It says, if the work anyone has built on the foundation survives, having passed through the fire, now if we look at these, we see straw, hay, and wood is not going to pass through the fire, right? It's going to be consumed. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, and though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. In other words, you're going to get through, but if your life has been spent um, uh, on foolish things, things that maybe seem wise to you but foolish to God, there is no reward for you. I don't know about you, but I want, if I'm going to get a reward, if I'm making an investment, uh, as I'm getting closer to retirement, I'm concerned about whether the things I invested in my 20s is going to provide for me enough resources when I'm, when I'm no longer able to work. I want to see that the, the small amount that I gave in the future, in not so far future now, uh, will produce for me what I hoped it would. And that's true here, that as, as we become a believer, every day we want to be making deposits uh, in heaven. We want to be living in such a way is that there is something for God that when he judges it, it will, uh, it will make it through that fire, and it will be found worthy of reward. And so Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, um, and you know Corinth is in Greece, and the Greece the Grecians, they valued wisdom. And so what they were doing is Paul had laid a foundation, and they said, you know what? Uh, obviously, the grace of God has been given to me. I'm totally saved and free. Uh, now, therefore, there is no condemnation in my life. 
And so uh, we know that every time that I sin, the grace of God raises up and, and, and it comes up. And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, understand that the spiritual things are good things, and that's what gets me into heaven. But this body of flesh is evil, and so I should be able to do with this body whatever I want to do. I can use this body for harm. I can pleasure this body at the expense of others. And because the body's evil, um, I don't have to worry as long as my spirit has been made alive in Christ. And Paul says, by no means do that. That's not what it's about. You have been saved so that you can be free from the old life and so that you can live in a new way. You're created for good works. You're not created for the old life. It says, why would having tore down the old life and surrendered it to God, would you rebuild that same life? He says, it doesn't make any sense. And God's not going to be mocked by that. But rather, the way you live should be according to the new nature, the new life that's in Christ Jesus. And he says to them in verse 19, it's not going to be on your screen, but he says, the wisdom of the world is folly to God. Don't get clever on God. Don't get clever in how you read the scriptures and how you allow yourself to kind of beat the system. There is no beating the system with God. There's either complete surrender or there's separation. He says, the thoughts of the wise are futile. He says, don't get clever. So, it's for the believers, both dead and alive. The purpose is not to get into heaven. The purpose is to determine the quality of the kingdom. And we've learned that some of our efforts will not be found Uh, with value, neither honoring nor glorifying God. Uh, Let me start with this. If you're not doing anything for God, don't worry, there's no reward and there's nothing to burn up. Um, You remember the servant who had the one talent, but he buried it instead of investing it? Uh, There's no reward for inaction with the, the calling God's placed on your life to obedience to his commands, to love, to love God, to love others, to love your believers deeply. There is something that's required of us and that God is going to look at our lives to see how much did you love me by loving others. Wow. You see, um, if we don't do anything, there's no reward. And secondly, then work done for improper reasons are not rewarded. God cares about the why you do it. We look at the outside, and we don't know your why, but God looks at your heart, and he knows why you do what you do. Um, there, is, there is some that, that do good things by giving, but they give to get. They're, they're not giving out of gratitude. The why should be gratitude. God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, it's out of gratitude that we give. And then work done without proper care, sloppy Christianity. It's good, but it's limited because there's little thought and there's little effort applied. Um, I don't know about you, but God is worthy of my best. Now, we used to demonstrate that by how we dressed, as if that was somehow a measure that God cared about. It's better to look good than be good, right? And so we would just dress ourselves all up, and that showed that we honored God. Now, you can honor God with your dress, uh, for sure, but it's done out of respect. It's not done uh, out of, I want to demonstrate to everybody else, I got the memo. Are you with me? We can do good things. So what is God looking for? He's looking for hard things, He's looking for the why we do the things we do. Do you really love God? Wow. How do we know you love him? It's by the love you have for one another. The Bible says you haven't seen God. How can you love a God you haven't seen uh, when, when you can't love the people you do see? 
Um, this lesson, and we're doing Safe People as one of the life groups, and, and this week I've been writing devotions, and what, I, what I've understood is that um, a lot of the way we live is still selfish even when we do good things. It's for self. It's not for the edification or the building up of other people. It's important, I think, that we get these things right. And so, someone took my notes away. Oh, there they are. <laughs> so there are some things that are found worthy that do pass through the fire. What are those things? What are the things that will be found acceptable? Well, it mentions silver, gold, and precious stones. These are beautiful expressions of our faith expressed in works that are on mission with God, meaning that we reach the lost and we're building up the body of Christ. How do you, are you reaching the lost? Are you sharing your faith? Are you investing to know other people so that you know uh, where you can speak to their need, so that you can serve them and love them? so that you can share the beauty of Christ. That is what's being, that's what's going to pass through the fire. Acts of service are going to pass through the fire. Jesus says that even a cup of cold water given in my name, uh, I'm going to keep good books on. I'm going to keep good records. The, if you're not serving the Lord, the bad news is, is God keeps good records. If you are serving the Lord, the good news is God keeps good records. Amen? And so um, it's also building up the body of Christ. Our role as pastors is to equip you, giving you the resources you need so you can love each other more deeply, so that you can share your gifts and talents with each other, so that you can together support each other in a way that's healthy, that allows for deepening relationships because only when our relationships are getting deeper with each other is our relationship with God growing. They grow together. You can't grow in your love for God without growing in your love for people. Can I get an amen? You can't grow in your love for people and not grow in your love for God. It is interconnected. It is interwoven. It is part of how we were created. And God is calling us to spend our life um, in reaching those who are perishing and loving on those that have become his followers into ever-deepening relationship with God. Can I get an amen? And in Revelation uh, 22, verse 12 and 13, Jesus uh, now speaking after he has uh, you know, Pastor Paul read the beautiful scripture where he's taking ownership of the seven seals. The seven seals now have all been opened. The seven trumpets have passed. The seven thunders have passed. And, and the seven bowls have been poured out. Christ is come and he ha is returned. He's established his kingdom. And now he's speaking again to the churches. Remember the churches at the beginning, there was... Um, there was the revelator who received his calling to prophesy. There was uh, the commission given by Jesus. Then God evaluated the churches and said, hey, look, you're, some of the stuff you're building is wood, hay, and stubble, and I have a problem with that. It's going to be consumed. Some of you are trying to build the kingdom of God with such poor theology and such poor ways of living that I'm just going to come and remove it completely and start over if you don't change. And then he gives this prophetic word that continues on to the churches. All of Revelation is for the church. The, the book of Revelation is not for the world. It's for the church. And as we read the book of Revelation, we're encouraged because we see Jesus becoming victorious, and we see the end of Satan's rule, and we see all these strengths transpiring, transpiring. And now we have Jesus, and he says to the church, look, I'm coming soon. And my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's going to give to each person, and it's going to be meted out our reward according to the quality of our work. It's just what Paul said. 
And then he describes himself again. So in case there's any doubt as to who's speaking, he said, I'm the same Alpha and Omega. I'm the same beginning and the end as I was in the beginning. Pretty cool, huh? He's saying that he will be the rewarder. Wow. So the fourth judgment we see is the judgment of Israel. Uh, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This happens during the tribulation period. Uh, two-thirds of Israel is conquered by the Antichrist and his kingdom, and they're destroyed. Um, and then the judgment of God is con- he doesn't allow it to continue any longer, and he saves for himself one-third of the Jewish people. Uh, you can find that in Ezekiel. But basically, if it happened today, that would mean two million Jews would be saved uh, and protected from the Antichrist. And so they call that a judgment of Israel uh, because Israel uh, is, is, is being uh, destroyed. But the truth is, is that God is rescuing those who put their faith in Christ and he's protecting them. Amen. And so then we see the judgment of the nations. <clears throat> now Christ has come. He's established his kingdom. And whoever's left on the earth and whatever national structures still remain, uh, they're going to come under judgment for how each nation, um, how each nation uh, treated Israel. Now, I, I want to make this very clear because we're Christian, and this book of Revelation is given to us as Christians uh, for us to understand how we're to think about the Jewish people, and we are to think of them as God's chosen people. Can I get an amen? There is no room for any, any anti-Semitic uh, f- attitudes or behaviors in the church. Can I get an amen? Um, we can have sympathies for those who are, are suffering because uh, of, of the Hamas government. We can have sympathy for those people. We can pray for those people. But we're not looking, uh, and we're not looking to destroy nor harm the Jews. Can I get an amen? Amen. Did I make that clear? All right. I mean, well, I'm not going to say that. The Lord does give discernment sometimes. So now we have then the judgment of Satan. Uh, This takes place in Revelation chapter 20. Let me read it to you. In verse 7, it says, And when... The thousand years are ended. This is the millennial reign of Christ. He's now been on the earth for a thousand years. He's been reigning. Uh, All of us who went with him for a reward have been given responsibilities on the earth. We're scattered throughout the earth and we're reigning with him. We are leaders in in whatever area he's placed us. And we are... Uh, We are causing the the rule of Christ to be manifest wherever he's given us authority over. Are you with me? And at the end of these thousand years, Satan will be released from his prison. So when the Antichrist and and his prophet are thrown alive into the lake of fire, Satan is in prison. There's still one more task that he has, one more thing that uh, God is going to allow uh, so that he can reveal the hearts of men. And so Satan will be released from his prison and will come out and deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, which traditionally is Iran and Russia, um, but who knows what that will look like after the tribulation period, who actually, what people groups are there, um, will gather uh, together for battle, and their number will be like the sand of the sea. So, Satan is going to come and do what Satan does. He's going to separate out based on the choices of man. Remember in the garden, Satan's job was to separate uh, Adam and Eve from God. Uh, He's the same. He has the same mission. Even after uh, he suffered this great defeat, he is going to come and he's going to speak to those that are alive during the millennial reign and he's going to offer them and, and deceive them into thinking that they can, they can be separate from the rule of Christ. And it says he'll be very effective. And that more than the sands of the sea are going to come and going to try to overthrow the rule of Christ. Exactly what Adam and Eve tried to do in the garden, 
Uh, mankind will try to do at the end of the world. And this time there's no battle. Uh, there's no conflict. Fire just falls from heaven and they're all consumed. And then we find that Satan is cast into the lake of fire. It says, but when fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Um, when I was a, a young man, I read a, a book, To Reign in Hell, uh, and it's this idea that, uh, yeah, I'm not a goody two-shoes, so I'm not going to get to go to heaven. I'm not going to get to walk on streets of gold, but I'm going to party with the devil for all of eternity. And I want to reign. I want to have responsibility in hell uh, so that I can take advantage of more and more people. And that, that's the idea. I'd rather, I, I'd rather reign in hell than be uh, a servant in the house of the Lord. And this concept is so theologically and unbiblical. I just want to take a moment to let you know there will be no party in hell. Uh, there's not going to be layers of debauchery in hell. Uh, it's not going to be a drug trip in hell. You'll be tripping, but not from that. It says that you'll be weeping and crying out. The pain will be so severe, and it will be relentless for all of eternity. I don't know about you, but that's not sounding like what that book described. Don't be deceived by the enemy. He wants to separate you from God, but he also wants to kill and steal and destroy from you any hope of heaven. He wants you to suffer like he's going to suffer. And his job is not to change his outcome. He knows that it is finished. When Christ rose from the, gra the grave, all power and authority was given unto him. The deal's over with Satan. He's a defeated foe, but he's still very skilled at making you think that being separate from God is in your best interest. It is not true. The wages of separation is death. The wages of sin leads to eternal death. There is no party in hell. There is no good place to go. It's not over when you, when you die. But everyone is appointed for judgment. Wow. Satan is going to forever be cast into the lake of fire, never to tempt anyone ever again. Can I get an amen? That's one of the reasons they were shouting, because they knew that Satan's time was very short. The last judgment we're going to talk about today is the judgment of the great white throne. In Revelations chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence the earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. There's no place to hide. There's no place to escape. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. What are these books? God has been keeping track of everything you've ever done, for good or for evil. They're opened up. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. The book of life is where when you come to know Jesus, he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. It means you belong to Jesus. Wow. And he's going to open up that book. And he says, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. You see, when you go through the judgment seat of Christ, your standing is good because it's in the merit of Christ. But when, if you stand before God at the white throne judgment, you're standing in your own merit. And the Bible says that no one is righteous, not one. 
So it means all who stand before the great white throne will be found guilty. In heaven, we the image of, of, of the legal system is God is judging and Jesus is our advocate. He's our lawyer. And the devil's the accuser. But God has thrown out the accuser of the brethren and Jesus has testified uh, as our lawyer that our debts have been wiped away. Wow. It says then death and Hades, the sea gives up its dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There's only two choices. You'll either be found not guilty because the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to your sin, or you will be found guilty and thrown into the lake of fire. There is no other choice here. And even if you thought there was an in-between state, the Bible says that, that in-between, that Hades, that grave being dead in the ground type of place, that that itself is thrown in there too. It's very clear there's heaven and then there's the lake of fire. It's one or the other. So what do we learn here? Every one of us must face judgment and that there's no escape. Although I didn't go through all of the resurrections that take place and all of the um, judgments that are in Scripture, uh, let me summarize by saying that Christians are judged first, Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, uh, tribulation martyrs, millennial believers, Um, At this point, they've already faced their judgment, and they face judgment not on their own merit, but on the merit of Christ, and they are reigning with Christ and forever receiving their reward. All others who are called the wicked dead now are resurrected to face judgment based on their merit alone. The books are open, and each person's life is examined, and all those all whose name is not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second death is not appointed as is the first death, but it's earned. Wow. It's earned. You would think... Living under the reign of Christ, you would think being created in the image of God and placed in a garden, you would think that that would sustain them to choose God over separation. But mankind has proven over and over and over again, if given the choice, will choose destruction and death over prosperity and eternal life. Those who go to hell have earned it. We often think, well, what if you're a good person? Uh, You know, you live a good life. You don't kill anybody. Uh, You know, you're a good guy. Don't you get to go to heaven? The Bible says there's not one righteous, no, not one. And that anything we do is contaminated somehow because our righteousness is like filthy rags. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. But you can be evil enough to go to Hades and to the lake of fire. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we've all screwed up. And what, we, what awaits us outside of Jesus is eternal torment and separation from God. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. He made a way of escape that we didn't deserve. He took upon himself the punishment that we couldn't free ourselves from. He did what we could not do for ourselves, but why we were yet sinners, why we were enemies of God. Christ died for us. He made a way that we would not suffer the consequences of wrath, but that we would live forever in the presence of God, experiencing the glory of the Son of God shining upon us, feeling the presence of God with it shakes and, and heaven shakes as we worship and, and enjoy each other. God has made a way of escape, and His name is Jesus. And there is no other name in heaven or under heaven by which men can be saved. Only Jesus can make the way for you to the Father because he was the only righteous one. Coming from heaven, fully God, being born of woman, conceived by the Holy Spirit, no sin in his life, he was fully man. And he lived a life of choosing God over choosing self. And though he didn't look forward to the cross in the sense of bring on the punishment, remember when he prayed and, and, and his physical body was so under uh, stress that drops of blood actually came out in his sweat as he cried out, Father, if there be any other way, I don't want to suffer this separation from you. I don't want to suffer that sin upon my life. Not for a moment do I want to be contaminated by the things that bring separation. But not my will and yours be done. And he went to the cross on your behalf to pay for a sin that he didn't commit so that you could live a life you didn't earn, so that you could be with him forever and ever and ever. So what do we do with a sermon like this? If you're online or, or you're here today and you don't believe that there is a heaven or a hell there is a lake of fire you don't believe there'll be any judgments you don't believe in jesus i, I have good news for you you just continue on just keep doing what you're doing and we won't know till the end but we will know but if you're a believer but you haven't become a follower of Jesus, you haven't confessed your sins, you know that it's true, but, but you haven't taken that step to become his follower, that you haven't gone from darkness to light, you're just looking from afar, if that's you, you I have good news for you today. The Bible says today is your day of salvation. The Bible says, if anyone will call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. What are they saved from? They're saved from themselves. They're saved from the wrath of God that's already being poured out against them. They are, are consecrated unto the Lord. They are set out not to be judged for their sin, but to allow for reward, eternal reward. You have a choice today. You can choose to stay on the outside, or you can choose to take a step that leads you into a life. I'm not going to tell you it's easy, but a life that will bring joy and peace and happiness and security. And you will have the blessed hope that when he returns, he will call your name and you will join him forever in the sky. And then you might be here and say, Pastor, well, I'm a believer and I'm a follower of Jesus. I have good news for you today that if you will consecrate yourself to the Lord, if you will consecrate your life to him, if you will, you will make sure that in your workplace that you're living like Jesus would live, 
that in your marriage you will pursue a relationship that will honor the Lord and glorify the Father. That, that in your riding the subway or, or taking the bus or, or, or in any con, uh, combination where you're with people, that you will be a light into those dark places and that you will seek the Lord so that you can show love to the lost and love to others and love to God in a way that blesses them. We are blessed to be a blessing. We're not a people who curse. We're a people who bless. And God is calling you to to increase the quality of your life. Yes, it often means changing the quantity, meaning that you'll have to do less of something so you have time to do more of others. But today he's calling you. He says, I'm coming soon. And I'm bringing with me rewards. Jesus is speaking to you today. And he's telling you, I understand the circumstance, the difficulties you're going through. I know how you stood and did the right thing, even though it cost you something here. I can promise you I'm going to reward you for it when you get to heaven. As we look at the final thoughts, if our worship team could come. He's spoken to the prophet. He's confirmed his commission. He has evaluated the churches. He has foretold the future. And now he's coming back to the church. He's told them that he's going to reward them, but he warns them that if you live like the world, you will be outside the gates. Heaven is not for those who continue to habitually sin, but for the righteous, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he gives them these words, which are our joy. He says, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed, blessed or happy is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book that you keep in mind that Christ is returning that Satan is not the winning horse in the race he says in 22 16 I Jesus have sent my angel or my messenger to testify to you about these things for the churches for us I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. You see, the morning star goes back all the way to a prophecy in the Old Testament. Remember Balaam and his prophetic word? He said that there would be a star that would rise. Stars were deities that the deity of Israel would rise, and in that deity's hand would be a scepter, meaning that he would be a divine king. And the brightness is that he is greater than any other supernatural force out there. He is the bright and morning star. And then he ends with... These five words, surely I am coming soon. At this point in the book of Revelation, there's a cry where the Spirit of God can't stand it any longer. And he cries out to his people. He says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Come even now, Lord Jesus. For that is the hunger of our hearts. That we, to be absent from the body, is present with the Lord. But we're grateful that you're coming and you're taking every part of us, our bodies that are in the grave, and you're resurrecting us and our spirits and our bodies become one in a new heavenly body. And those of us alive and remain, those of us who have corruption in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts, that corruption is set aside and that which cannot be corrupted is given to us, that more Mortality is left, and immortality is ours. 
we say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, let this be the hour. Let this be the moment as we're worshiping you on the final song, as we're praying together, as we're confessing our sins, as we're worshiping you and calling upon your Holy Spirit to help us. Let that be the time. Come quickly, Lord Jesus.